The, my, my whole philosophy is to take care of myself. This journalist was surprised. And then he insisted, he said, but no, no, no I, I'm serious. I'm asking a serious question. I mean, tell me about you. No, no, he said, yeah, my philosophy and everybody's philosophy is to take care of yourself, of myself. My philosophy to take care of myself. And of course, the interview continues to go, but I, I, I want to ask you, what is your philosophy? Of course, to take care of yourself, which is good. If you don't know how to take care of yourself, how are you going to help me? But this, you know, there is, a, a, you heard about this uh, Russian-American great uh, novelist called uh, Ayn Rand. I quoted her. She wrote, something, uh, the virtue of selfishness. Hmm? Now, we in the Ibrahimic tradition, we have this, that you have to care about your neighbor, you have to be ready to sacrifice for your neighbor, and said there is no faith without sacrifice and so on. So she is developing so-called objectivist ethics, in the sense that you have to be, first of all, self-conscious, Take care of yourself. And I would say that Muslim and the Muslim community is the greatest contribution to the Muslim at large if you are not problem yourself and if you can solve your own problem. Once you can solve your own problem personally, you are a great blessing for all of us. Because everyone is, take, is asking help. So what I'm trying to say, but there are some people who have more energy to not only to care for ourselves, but to care for others. And these people are called politicians. <laughs> and these people are called leaders of the community. And they have to have more time. You see, in, you have yourself, you have to take care of yourself, of your wife, of your children, and it's, it's a job, it's a business. But how, uh, if, if somebody tells you you have to take care of a million people, of two million, of 60 million, like Recep Tayyip Erdogan, 80 million Turks all around the world, and in, in, in Turkey. And not only about the Turkey, but also he has to go to Syria, to Egypt, to Tunisia, to everywhere. And everyone is expecting from him that he's a magician who can solve all the problem that is in the Middle East. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to say that there are some people who whom God gives more energy to take care of others. And we should appreciate that. This is what is called leader. And no one can be leader, no, not everybody can be leader. And this is when you recognize somebody, especially in young people, who have this ability to take care of others, please support him, so that he become later on the one who will take care of everybody. The, the, uh, the, my connection with Dalai Lama is exactly a philosophy of that we should take care of every, each one of, of ourselves, but at the same time that we should recognize others who have time, energy, and will to take care of others too, and then support him. And this is what these are called leaders. And your uh, first question, first of all, thank you for UIA. And I, wa I want to acknowledge uh, uh, UIA in Kuala Lumpur. That is, it is the best experience in my life. We would like to thank that uh, the Malaysian government and UIA that gave scholarships to the students from Bosnia. Now they, all the students who studied at UIA came back to Bosnia and they took very high positions in society and government. There are three ambassadors of four ambassadors who uh, uh, graduated at UIA. One is in Tehran, one is in Peking, one is in um, uh, Jakarta, and one is in Kuala Lumpur. So, so UIA produced uh, ambassadors from the state of Bosnia. Congratulations to UIA, not to the... <laughs> and and thank you very much for uh, giving me this compliment I needed because, you know, uh, and I am very glad when uh, my, uh, uh, my brother minister uh, 
Yaku Ibrahim was uh, reading uh, my credentials. My wife is here because he, she doesn't believe sometimes that I am so good. <laughs> so this is very good that, uh, that he read that openly before the public, so I have now proof. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I like his definition of politician, not because it suits us, but I think the truth of the matter is the ruling party in Singapore do it because we want to make sure that Singapore continues to be a very good nation. That's good. Can I invite the last two, the uh, first lady and the second lady, together so that uh, the Mufti can answer both questions? Uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, Sheikh Dr. Mustafa. Uh, my name is Raihan. And alluding to what you said earlier about how the most dangerous people in Islam are the Muslims themselves. So, uh, as we know, the Muslim Ummah is facing this problem of terrorism and radicalization all over the globe. So, I'd like to ask, what can we as a Muslim community do to counter this problem? And uh, what can the religious authorities and governments do? And are they doing enough? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Siti Norbia. I just want to ask your opinion um, on the challenges of the Muslim woman position in the modern society. While we are in pursuit of higher edu education, be it in Islam studies and all secular studies, what will your advice be for us to stay on route to be a good Muslim, inshallah, while being on par with our fellow non-Muslim ladies in this modern world? Thank you. Regarding these people who are violent and, and uh, disturb us and this is why we read there's a special prayer as you know Rabbana la tu'akhizna bima fa'ala sufaha minna may God uh, not uh, take uh, and uh, charge us for the sins of those uh, crazy or, or irresponsible people who do bad things on our behalf so this is this is our prayer so we first of all we can Everyone, please remember this and pray every day so that we don't have these people who do things bad and then they associate to Islam. Now, there is no Islamic terrorist and Islam means in itself peace and you cannot represent the name in a terror that means something different. But unfortunately, we have this... A challenge and an embarrassment for all of us, especially after the 11th of September, after uh, in 2004 in Madrid, that uh, after 7/7 in 2005, as you know, not to mention what happened in Istanbul and uh, Bali, you know, the Indonesia the, and Jakarta and so on, and we had series of this kind of. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, in India, what is uh, uh, in Bombay, and, and all other things. Uh, it is, on the other hand, it is too much highlighted that this is Islamic phenomenon. It is almost, there is a logic, not all terrorists are Muslims, but all, uh, or, uh, the other way, not all Muslims are terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslims. Uh, and it, is, it was very hard for us to live and, uh, and, and or explain all the time. And even when you mention the, the name terrorism, when it's mentioned in the media, immediately, even we Muslims are uh, now victims of this propaganda. So they, we feel uh, guilt of what is happening there. I think it's not fair that this kind of attribution to Muslims is there because if a Christian do something wrong, and I think we will agree with me, there are Christians who did something wrong of, of the sort. We Muslims don't blame Jesus for that. We don't say Jesus is responsible. We don't say the, the Bible is responsible, so you have to change the Bible because of that. And if some Jews do something wrong, and you know that they do, there are some Jews who do wrong, we don't blame Moses, Musa because of that, and we don't blame Torah. 
But when it comes to Muslims, any Muslim do, then the whole world is shouting and trying and asking us, you have to change the Quran. You have to, you know, they blame the Prophet, they make cartoons, they do all these things and saying that this is because of, this is not fair. Yes, I think we should be bold and recognize that there are people who are doing wrong things on our behalf. And we should stand up and say, we condemn this and this is not, we don't allow that this should be done on our behalf. This is what we have to do. But I think this is not enough. We have to work and we have to be uh, awakened. We have to be, uh, we have to be knowing uh, in our neighbor, in our house, in, in, in talking with our parents, with our friends, and, uh, and uh, you know, recognizing these kind of things that uh, can be dangerous for us. Now, if any society in the world is uh, peaceful, and he has this tradition of uh, doing good to others, it was Norway. And I just came from Norway, just uh, a few days. Uh, I attended this 200,000, 200 uh, years of the, of the anniversary of the Oslo University. And they invited me to attend the conference on how to counter terrorism and so on. And you know what happened with Breivik, but you, you should know that this book uh, that the Breivik uh, terrorist Breivik wrote uh, called Manifesto that is available in the, uh, the, on the internet, that he claims that he got the ideas from the Serbian war criminals who uh, committed genocide against Muslims. And in this manifesto he asked openly that the Muslims, autochthon, indigenous Muslims in Europe should be wiped out. This is, this is the written in, 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 in the manifesto. So I was uh, glad I went to the, to the island uh, of, uh, in, in, in Norway and it is very strange, very strange that he, he brought a car with uh, explosive and he uh, 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 fired this explosive uh, in the city of Oslo and then from there he went to Ireland where there were the Labour Party that was also many members of the Muslim, Muslims. He went there and with the police uh, dress, uh, this uniform, with a gun, uh, Kalashnikov, I don't know what, what was in his hand, and then he invited all these young men saying, come on, there is explosion there, I want to protect you as a policeman. And all these young men came to him and then he, he shot them, uh, 77 of them. It's very interesting, there's a story said that among these people, there was one Muslim girl and he was running after this young man to kill each and every one. And there was one Muslim girl that was uh, uh, saying Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And there was one Norwegian boy that was repeating after her, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And they both were saved. And this boy later on, on uh, even on television, as Imam uh, Sanaid informed me, he uh, uh, confessed uh, as a Muslim. He said Shahada because he said, I believe that this Allahu Akbar saved me. I mean, this is, it, there are different ways of of uh, people, how they, uh, you know, uh, see and understand things. So now, in, in Norway, when, when we were, I am very, uh, I mean, uh, very glad that uh, people in Norway, from the Bishop of uh, Norway, uh, of Oslo, Bishop of Oslo, who in Munich talked and said, I, we Norwegians lived in the belief that uh, never would happen to us such thing like happened there because uh, they thought that they, they did everything what is necessary. But when it happened now, we are in a shock. And then he said that we will stand up and we will not allow that the Muslims be uh, uh, in a way, uh, targets for these people. 
So what I want to say that there, there are two situations about terrorism. In the time of war, you can expect that some kind of crimes can be done. But in the time of peace, it's very difficult to see and to predict what will happen. So this is something, I think, of, of, the, of the phenomenon of this civilization. But what I would like you to, what would like to advise, sometimes it is good that we speak this uh, openly in the public about this, this phenomenon. But on the other hand, if you speak too much about it, you give uh, the, I, I mean, uh, you give the ideas uh, what to do. But if you don't speak about it, then it is dangerous that you don't speak about it, and then you are surprised. So it always is the problem how to find the balance, how to find the right way. But in all in all, I think uh, what we should do, uh, those, those of us who think that are normal, and we are normal, alhamdulillah, I think we should be cautious and we should be alert and we should not give anything for the chance. And uh, communities must coordinate. I am impressed what I have seen in Singapore. Please, continue this. And I would like to tell you something individually. I mean, rely on God and yourself. Don't listen too much what the others say outside. Please, be aware of your, uh, and take care of yourself. Remember this philosophy, take care of yourself. Once you take care of yourself, then you are capable to take care of others. So this is what I would like to suggest to you. About Muslim women, thank you very much, sister, for asking this question. I was expecting, I, 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 I thought that this is going to be the first question uh, after my lecture. But I, I have only, I have one simple advice for you, and that is, don't expect from the man to give you your rights. You have to fight yourself for your rights. And please quote me wherever you go. <laughs> The Grand Mufti told me, you are not the one who give me right, I have to fight for my right. But don't be violent. <laughs> be nice with arguments. What I want to say, I wish that the Muslims, especially Muslim women, be more proactive. I believe that our sisters are not proactive. Now, I know one sister, who complained to me and he, he criticized me a lot because he saw that uh, he, he got the chance. I was, you know, because uh, I got uh, used to get this criticism from my wife and then when other women are criticizing me, I have some training. <laughs> so I was just silent and, and, and was uh, patient to listen and when when she finished all this criticism, it was very, very severe. And then I said to her, my sister, I agree all what you say. So I support you. And then she, she said, why should you agree what I say? I don't need your agreement. I, I mean, this, uh, this is another, another uh, aspect of uh, feminism, if you like that they don't want to share anything with the man. I, I, don't, I would not advise you this way. But I do advise you that you be proactive. I mean, that you, you, that you don't expect that somebody come and tell you, you know, because you, 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 you need the right, give it, you know, be smart. No, this is not happening. So you have to be proactive and like this, asking question openly. And by and large, I think, uh, decent Muslims do uh, have a good relationship to their, uh, to their wives hmm? because, you see, who, who gave us birth? How did we come to this, uh, to this world? It is our mother. And this is why we have in the hadith that Prophet Muhammad said three, three times, mother, 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 and then father. And believe me, I, even today, I don't know the birthdays of my, my children, but my wife knows. 
I mean, not because, uh, I'm, uh, but because I know that she knows, so I don't need to. <laughs> so she's taking, she's taking care of my children, and I am taking care of, of, the, of, the, of my nation. So ever we, we have divided the labor. What, what I'm trying to say is that uh, the best thing in this world that God has given us is the human being. And the most, uh, the most enjoyable thing that we have here is that you have a love and then you have a peaceful and you have a, a pleasant uh, family life. You know, they say I am not rich, but they say that I am famous. But you have to be both rich and famous. Then you are complete your, your, your personality, all right? I am not rich, but somehow I am famous. <laughs> In, in, the, in terms that people know me. But I, I want to tell you something. The most enjoyable time of my life is when, when, is when, I'm, when I am with my family. Because I know that this is the only that I possess in my life. All good friends that I know, all my colleagues, all my work, all everything, they are all good, and I, I like them. Some of them don't like me. I don't, I don't like them. I mean, this is, this is life. But at home, when I have come, I have a grandchild. His name is Nadir. This is the most enjoyable thing in your life. I did love my, my, my children, but somehow I love more my grandchild. I don't know why. <laughs> But somehow he's, he, he's uh, you know, part of my life. I think of him. I, anything that he does, say, it is like, you know, a revelation for me. <laughs> I enjoy it. So family is something that, uh, you know, we have to get. And who is the, who, who holds the family? Woman, mother, your wife. So you have to have the respect. As to uh, the public life and whether uh, the women should be involved more in the society and have more rights and be in the parliament and so on, I have heard that you have women in your parliament. I just met uh, Minister Halima, uh, that she is responsible, she is state minister, responsible for development and community development and sport and youth. And she raised the issue there when we were about uh, what I think about, about women. I, I think very good of women. So, but one advice, one simple advice. Huh? Please be proactive. Work and don't wait that somebody will give you your rights. You have to fight for your rights and I will support you despite of you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we have to assure the Sheikh that in Singapore, Muslim women are very proactive. Several of them run Muslim organizations. One of them is heading one of our biggest organizations here, Madamolia here. And several of them are also sitting on the Muslim Religious Council of Singapore. And by the way, uh, but those your people who organized my visit, they know that my secretary is woman. <laughs> so I'm very proud. So this is my argument when they attack me that I don't take care of women. I said, you see, my secretary is woman. So then they shut up. <laughs> All right. And also another point I'd like to add, um, Excellency, that you mentioned about secularism. We are living in a secular society in Singapore. But our secular society, as you really pointed out, is very different from other societies. We recognize 10 official religions. We recognize the role of religion in society. There is a close participation between the state and religion. And that is why I think yesterday's at lunch, you met the interfaith leaders, where in fact there is a proactive uh, engagement between government and uh, people of religious faith. So with that, I think you know, we all... If I may, if I may just uh, confirm, I live also in... Uh secular society of Bosnia and Herzegovina, even though some say that it's Islamic State, Muslim State, whatever. Okay, I, I, I don't dispute with them. Let them 
uh, talk whatever they like. But I would avoid uh, using the term secular because it has this uh, ideological implication and especially connected with the communism that uh, failed. I think it's better when we talk about in which society a state we live, it's better to say we live in democratic society and the society that observes the human rights and all this. So democratic means secular, basically, you know, because democracy, demo what is democracy? It is uh, the principle of, uh, uh, you know, uh, producing the laws in the parliament by the people who are elected by the people. So then you have the representation. And these laws are abiding for, for everyone who lives in that society. So this is the, this is the uh, core, what we call society, uh, secularism, or let's say, so we all live and should live in democracy. And I think democracy is a value, human rights and democracy are two most important values for the modern civilization. I hope we will continue to maintain this and to develop this, and I, I hope that the Muslims will learn these two great principles of the modern society and that this should be uh, their target for the uh, further development. Why Turkey is a good model for, for today? Because Turkey is exercising these two principles. Very simple, democracy and human rights. And if you have this, then you have successful society. Everyone is there is happy and everyone is part participating. And also I would encourage Muslims to think about so-called civil society or non-governmental organizations. You know, in the United States, on, each, on 50 uh, citizens, there are one non-governmental organization. And compare that to Egypt, for example, on 80,000 people, there is only one non-governmental organization. So we have to uh, organize ourselves in this, uh, because there are f uh, four forms of organization. Tribal, hierarchical, hierarchical, and bureaucratical, and network organization. I think the, this so-called modern civilization on the West is based on this network organization where you have the core and around it you have these small uh, units that are connected and everyone is equal. Everyone feels that is uh, somehow equal and everyone, uh, no one is, uh, 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 doesn't, no one feels that there is up there somebody uh, over him. But he feels like uh, uh, one of many uh, units that work for the same goal for the same goal of the social benefit and uh, social good. So in that respect, I think we Muslims should learn um, a lot. Uh, I know that it is, uh, it is good uh, that you know the Quran by heart. It's good that you have hadith. Uh, but I'll tell you something. When I was uh, in, 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 in the war in, in Bosnia, in 1993, there was a pilot who, ha who was supposed to drive me from one place to another. And it was very dangerous. And the area that we were going by the uh, helicopter, we could be targeted by the uh, enemy forces. So I asked him how, how, is pos how the possibility is that, you know, we, c we can be hit. He said, 80%. Uh, so only 20% survival. <laughs> and I said, I asked him, do you know any, anything, do you know how to read Shahada or do you know anything in the Quran? And uh, he said, no, no I, I didn't go to a maktab, I don't know. I mean, I know how to be a pilot, but I don't know how to read, how to. So I said to him, would you allow me to teach you, you know, he said, okay, but uh, before you teach me shahade, I should, uh, you know, allow me to teach you how to pilot the helicopter. <laughs> so, so in case I, uh, you know, I die, that you can take, <laughs> take over. So then I said to him, okay, all right, let us divide now our roles. 
I will read Shahada and I will read the Quran and you uh, pilot the helicopter. So I appreciate what you know and you should appreciate what I know. What, 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 what I'm trying to say, in this particular case, of course it is good that you have, the, you, you have knowledge of everything, but in this particular case it's very important that this pilot knows how to pilot helicopter. Otherwise, I, I was not able to get from one place to another. So we have to appreciate the science, the knowledge, uh, that is, you know, different, not only uh, of, of uh, a religious sort, uh, in particular, we should be religious, but let uh, some people memorize the Holy Quran. But doesn't mean that every one of us must memorize the all everybody because there is Quran in, 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 the, in the book and let appreciate those who memorize the Quran but those who memorize Quran should appreciate those who know how to pilot helicopter and the airplane so that we go, can go and, and flight and, 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 and travel so this sort of, of things I think as Muslims we should uh, understand and increase our knowledge and be knowledgeable and be aware on the, in which society we live. And of course, my minister, uh, uh, Yaakov Ibrahim, I don't know whether he had a longer session, uh, but uh, you, you should know, when you give the microphone to Mufti, it is very, very hard to take it off. <laughs> so thank you very much. I, I wouldn't dare to take the microphone away from your friend Shay, but we have a schedule and really we will thank you for all the wisdom that you shared with us this afternoon. I'm sure he deserves another round of applause for the information and the wisdom. So with that, I hand back to the MC, please. Bismillah rahman rahim His Eminence, Grand Mufti Shay, Dr. Mustafa Sharich, Honorable Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Tiu Chi Hen, Honorable Dr. Yaku Ibrahim, Minister for Information, Communication and the Arts and Minister in Charge of Muslim Affairs. Excellencies, Saibo Samha Mufti, Dr. Fatris Bakaram, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. <clears throat> Salaam Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. May peace be upon you. This afternoon we have been very honored to have with us our third most distinguished visitor, his Eminence, Sheikh Dr. Mustafa Sharich, to enlighten and inspire us with his profound wisdom and thoughtful insights. In typical Singapore style, we usually make our visitor work very, very hard. Uh, Grand Mufti had been on the move for the last four days from one engagement session to another engagement session, from one visit to another visit from one courtesy call to another courtesy call. The messages that Grand Mufti conveyed to all his audiences over the last few days are simple yet profound. He impressed upon us that in implementing Islamic laws and in practicing Islam, we must respect the higher principles of protecting human dignity and rights and the importance of embracing progressive religious interpretation is another aspect that the Grand Sheikh has always reminded us even today. And last but not least, he emphasized on the need to care for our young, for they will be the decisive factor in building a cohesive and forward-looking society. Today, our eminent Sheikh has once again reiterated the need to respect diversity and to forge inter-religious solidarity for the betterment of our community and society at large. So before I close, on behalf of Moes, I'd like to express our deepest gratitude, deepest appreciation to His Eminence, Dr. Mustafa Sharik, for availing five days of his extremely busy schedule to be with us in Singapore. On the lighter side, when Grand Mufti landed in Singapore, he uttered three words or three phrases in our initial conversation that showed his familiarity with Singapore. Apakaba, how are you? Nasi goreng, 
fried rice, and last but not least, durians. <laughs> His Eminence has insisted that he should have a feast of durians before he leaves Singapore. <laughs> and he was so insistent, he left us no room for dialogue, negotiation or reconciliation. Your, your Eminence, the Duran Feast is waiting for you. Inshallah, you. we'll be arranging one, a good one for you. And it is from Singapore. Made in Singapore. <laughs> 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 the, the taste is very special. <laughs> Imported from Malaysia. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 We'd like to also thank Madam Azra Sharik for accompanying Grand Mufti. <clears throat> And in the Mufti's words, you are his mahram. We wish to also thank uh, Imam Sinaid Kobilika, the president of the, Norway Islamic, the Islamic Council of Norway, who assisted the Grand Mufti during this visit. We also like to express our deepest appreciation to Minister Yaakob Ibrahim for inviting Sheikh Dr. Mustafa to Singapore and for graciously chairing this afternoon's session. And also to Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Tiu Chihan, for honouring us with his presence. <clears throat> I'd like to take this opportunity to profusely thank Singapore Press Holdings Foundation for their strong funding support for the MUIS Distinguished Visitor Programme. And finally, I would like to thank each and every one of you for your presence today and also to all those who have made this event possible. We hope to see you again at the next Moe's Lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raji Alami. Ladies and gentlemen, we would now like to present a token of our appreciation to our distinguished visitor for 2011. For this, may I invite the Mufti of Singapore, Sahib Samaha, Dr. Muhammad Fatris Bakaram, to join Minister Mufti and Haji Alami on stage, please. NDPM.